Okay, our next speaker is Yael Kalai, and she will talk about crypt cryptography resilient to physical attacks. So uh, hi everybody, uh, I'm Yael Kalai and I'm a researcher here in the lab and uh, my main uh, focus in research is on cryptography and that's what I want to tell you about today, cryptography uh, that's resilient against physical attacks which has been kind of one of the main focuses of my research in the last uh, three years or so, pretty much whenever I, jo when I joined the lab. So okay. Let me start with telling you about kind of the wonderful world of uh, cryptography. So actually, let me say this introduction is uh, an introduction which was made by Boz Barak. And uh, I really like it, so I'm borrowing it. Uh, OK, so the wonderful world of cryptography. So I'm a cryptographer. I love cryptography. And let me convince you that you, know, you should love it too. Uh, we've made a lot, a lot of progress, or a lot of progress has been made probably in the last 35 years or so. So by now, we know how to do you know, secure encryption, secure authentication. We know how to do public key cryptography, which is really surprising. It essentially says that two people, when they want to, do, to encrypt messages to one another, they don't need to meet and decide on a secret key. But rather, if I want people to encrypt messages to me, I'll, I'll generate a secret key on my own, and I give, I'll give everybody my public key. So it was a concept that uh, was put forth by Diffie and Hellman in the late 70s, very beautiful. Uh, zero knowledge proofs, which are very uh, surprising, kind of paradoxical, uh, which essentially say that you can prove things without giving any information about, uh, why, about why the theorem is correct. Uh, this was notions put forth by uh, uh, Shafi Goldwasser, so Silvio Mikali, and um, Rakov. Thank you, Silvio. Good to hear. And uh, many, many others, secure multi-party computation, identity-based encryption. There's many, many, many cryptographic schemes, tasks that we know how to do today. So really, you know, the situation in cryptography is fantastic. So let me just, you know, I don't want to mislead you. We didn't solve all the problems in the universe in cryptography either, so I still need my job. Uh, so for example, there's still some open problems in the area. There's the problem of software obfuscation, which is still wide open. We don't know how to do. And I've been kind of obsessed with this one. And even the problem that we have solved, uh, we haven't solved them completely. So there's still, you know, this is assuming, some of them assume that we don't, know, we don't have quantum computers. And if quantum computers come about, then they may break. Uh, others assume some mathematical assumption. And if some mathematical breakthroughs come about, again, they can break. And not to mention efficiency. But the point I want to make is that we made a lot of progress and things are looking great in cryptography. Let me contrast that with kind of you know, the ugly world of security. I hope I'm not insulting anybody. But uh, even though cryptography made so much progress, still somehow in real world, things are getting broken over and over again. And we haven't even solved the very basic problem of secure communication. Okay, And in some sense, we're much worse today than we were, let's say, 20 years ago. Because the hackers and our attackers are becoming much more sophisticated. And we hear about all these stories over and over again about things being hacked, about security broken, and so on. So my goal, or our goal, I think, as a community, and a lot of us who have been, have been invested in this, is trying to bridge this gap. So in order to bridge this gap, we need to understand, why is there a gap? So let me give you some reasons, OK? So the first reason is, you know, let's face it, security is annoying, OK? Nobody, I, you know, when I'm asked every three months to uh, you know, renew my password, I'm so annoyed, I just want to do 1111. So you know, if we don't have security, <laughs> you know, things will be broken. OK, so that's one reason. Then there's another reason that the, human, the users are human. They make mistakes. Not only them, actually the designers are human. They also make mistakes. So there's sometimes bugs in our program. So when we prove security, it's assuming everything is correct. But actually, there may be bugs. And hence, security does not hold anymore. And then there's what's called physical attacks. And that's what I want to talk about today. That's part of what I've been kind of obsessed with in the last three years. I've also done some research. I've been kind of interested in the problem of constructing algorithms that are robust uh, to bugs in them. But I'm not going to mention that today. So I want to focus on the problem of constructing cryptographic schemes that are resilient to physical attacks. So what do I mean by physical attacks? So in, in the theoretical world of cryptography, traditionally it was assumed that our computer is secure. It sits in some kind of a safe. Okay, There's a secret key there, which is 
completely hidden, it was randomly chosen, it's completely hidden from the adversary. However, in real life, in reality, actually the uh, attackers, they, they have several physical means by which they attack our systems. And here are just some examples. So for example, uh, there's what's called timing attack, we actually time the time it takes to do the computation, and best, based on the time, let's say, that it takes to produce a signature, you learn information about the secret key that's being used. Uh, or acoustic attack, where you listen, and based on the noise that the CPU makes, you may gain information, and so on and so forth. And there's also what's called radiation attacks, or in particular, microwave attack, as this name has been used, where attackers put smart cards inside a microwave, and uh, what happened, this ra the radiation caused mutation in the secret key. And they used this uh, tampering to break the systems. So there's all these physical attacks. Uh, very broadly speaking, they can be partitioned to two groups. Leakage attacks, where the adversary do not change the secret key, but they just gain information about the secret key. And the other is tampering attacks, which include the, micro the radiation attacks, where the adversary actually tampers with the secret key. So I think the goal, or one of the goals of the uh, theoretical cryptographers is to design schemes that withstand such attacks. So let me, there actually has been a lot of work in this area very recently in particular. And the area of leakage resilient cryptography, let me just mention a few results. <laughs> and this is a subset, if I had longer so I would put more. Note that almost everything starts from like 2009. So in the last few years, there's been a really large kind of big leakage boom in the community where people are really invested in trying to, to come up with schemes that are resilient to leakage. Okay, also in the regi regime of tampers in cryptography, progress has been made. Not as much, unfortunately. Not because we're not interested, but because it may be a harder problem. So there's still some, still some more uh, room for improvement there. But let me explain to you one thing that, for example, we can do. Okay, so let me give you kind of an example. So we have, let's say, encryption scheme or signature scheme that resilient against the following adversary. Okay, so we can, re we can resist ourselves, we can be sure that we're secure against the following adversary. So here's an adversary, he has a smart card, the secret key is sitting there, and he tries to learn the secret key. He, tr he wants to break the system, okay? What can he do? So first he gets the public key. Okay, so let's say there's a public key associated with it. Then he can ask for a leakage query. You know, he can time, he can use acoustic attack. He's trying to attack somehow, and he gets information about the secret key. Then he may tamper with the secret key. He may put it in the microwave, and as a result, the secret key is, it convert, is gonna convert to, it's gonna be mutated. And then he can leak again and get leakage. And you know, if let's say it's a signing card, he can ask for a signature, and a signature will come out, and so on and so forth. And the goal say, even against such adversary, we're still secure, okay? So he, can, he still cannot break the system. Okay, at this point, you guys should be very suspicious and say, you know what, forget about tampering, just leakage. What do you mean you can leak over and over again? Here I'm, here's what I'm gonna do, I'm an adversary, I'm gonna leak as for the first bit, leak as for the second bit, the third bit, and so on, eventually I'll get the secret key. So how can you be secure against continual leakage? So it, even though you may think it's impossible, let me show you how it is possible. So you need to slightly think outside the box, you know, and, and, and let me show you kind of one technique that we use in this area to make, to get pos pos positive results. So the idea is to update the secret key. So what do we mean? There's a secret key here. The adversary may get leakage. But what we'll do, I have like one more minute, right? They told me I can get one. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, so what? Yeah, no, I'm finishing in two seconds. Okay, so then the secret key can be updated. What we're gonna do, we're gonna update the secret key in each time period. So the leakage he gets are gonna be with respect to different secret keys. But the main point is that the public key should remain the same. So nobody in the world knows that I'm actually updating my secret key and, be, and becoming secure against these leakage attacks. These are done in, my, in the computer's belly without the outside world noticing. And as long as the leakage in this time period is bounded, we can prove that the schemes are secure. So that's just one glimpse of uh, type of technique we use. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you, Yaya. So I'm sure there are many questions and we have still a little bit of time, so for one or two, depending on how fast you ask your question. Yeah, can you go to the Cryptography is such a beautiful, beautiful theoretical subject, but I wonder if you could talk about the distinction or the connection between cryptography as a theoretical area and, and cryptography as something that, that's driven by the real world attacks or the real world 
So, okay, so I think in general, cryptography is an area that's driven by real world attacks. I mean, it's true that it has fundamental, very interesting fundamental mathematics in it. But what drives the field is practice. It's a field that's driven by practice. And here's just an example. The, uh, the motivation of this research is applied motivation. At the end of the day, what we're doing is math. It's true that there are schemes that are more, there are people that work on more trying to just improve constantly, like really ship things out the door. And I think these improvements have, look, often they have a different flavor to them. So we kind of, I think there's uh, various levels uh, to cryptography. You know, some, th some aspects of, some people in cryptography work on negative results. You know, you can think that's maybe very fundamental. However, it's also related to practice. So I think it's, a, all of cryptography I think is driven by practice. But some things are more kind of practiced this minute as opposed to kind of maybe a little more long term. But I think all of cryptography is driven by practice. Okay, thank you, Yael. It was a wonderful talk. Okay, 